Hi, friends, and welcome to another Robcast. And I have with me Troy Anderson, and you live in Bangladesh. Yep, most of the time. How long have you lived there? About the last five years. Okay, so tell me about an average... Where'd you grow up, by the way? All over the world. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I lived, grew- yeah, I lived in four countries outside of the U.S., and now yeah. you, you wake up in the morning in Bangladesh and you go to work. And what, like, do you have an office? Yeah, so I live in a building in Bangladesh that my organization speak up uh, rents. And in our building, we have 40 girls and young women that's a dorm for them. And it's a big office and families live there and I live there. So my whole team lives together in this big dorm. And did you start this organization? Yeah. And how did you get into this work? How did it all start? Um, the, well, I started it when I was a law student. So I, was, I went to law school because I wanted to be a lawyer to help, in particular to help poor women who are being exploited. Because before, well, I grew up in a lot of different countries and saw a lot of poverty and a lot of, you know, just terrible things. But especially before law school, I was um, working with some groups and volunteering with groups that were helping get girls out of brothels. And so once, one of the reasons I went to law school was to be involved in that work. Well, um, was it your parents' work that you're moving all over the place? Yeah. My dad was a teacher and a principal of international schools. And what countries and did you live in? Dominican Republic, Yemen, Syria, Norway. Norway, Syria, Yemen, Dominican Republic. Yeah. So I got the whole, <laughs> you got the spectrum of culture, religion. Like, and did you, so it's like high school, junior high, all that. Yeah, Mostly Did, growing up, I was high school in the U.S. a couple of years, and I graduated in Norway. But my, yeah, grade school and junior high was in the Middle East. Did you, in Yemen? And Syria, yeah. High school in Yemen. Did you th- know this is an unusual upbringing? Um, or was this just no. normal? Because well, it's no, anything it's is normal knew. until right. I got back to the U.S. for part of high school, and I realized my new friends didn't know anything about the world. And I thought, well, I lived in Syria. I lived in Damascus. And people were like, well, there's a Damascus in Oregon. It's like, no, I lived in the Damascus. So I, real, it was, I realized when I was back in the U.S. that it wasn't normal. Right. Yeah. And you had seen uh, poverty and, and young girls being exploited. And we're like, I'm going to go be a lawyer and do something about this. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I not the girls' exploitation stuff as much, but just poverty in general when mm-hmm. I was a kid. So um, it was more like later on as an, a young adult that I saw and traveled and saw some of the stuff like in girls in terrible circumstances and in the brothels and did some undercover kind of work, like things like that. What's, that, that, was, what's that like? Tell me what, like, what undercover work would be like. How old well, were you at that? How old this were you? was I was in my early 30s. Yeah, like 10, 12 years ago. So, I mean, there's some organizations, Christian organizations and other ones like nonprofits that go in and they need to investigate these brothels where there are girls under 18 being held. Against their will. Against their will, yeah. I mean, even if 17-year-old girls, I mean, no, it's, yeah, no one is in, a, in prostitution that's their choice. And so, unfortunately, there's some places where Western men go, and so the only way to investigate those places is to get guys that look like me to go there and with the camera on your lapel or your tie and pretend you're there but take pictures of what's going on. So I did that in, well, Thai Burma border with some organizations and in India. But it's in India where it really, well, both places, it really, really disturbed me. I mean, you see stuff like that and you, it changes you. I saw, you know, the first time I went into a place was the Thai Burmese border. And there were these girls who were probably 10, 11 years old tiny girls. Their bodies aren't even developed, and you could buy them for five bucks, literally. In like a market or like a... No, they, most of those places are like a... Um, they might have a bar that's kind of the front. The, one, the first one I went to was a bar where the ground floor was a bar, pool tables and stuff like that. But you knew that if you wanted, you could go upstairs to where the girls were being held. And you would go in and sort of gather the evidence... Yeah, and, and I mean, I was like a rookie, and I just helped volunteering as a law student and before with some organizations. So there are groups that do this as right. their thing, but I was just learning about it a little bit with the group there and in India. When you're yeah. seeing this for the first time, and then you're going back to your hotel room in the evenings or something, yeah. how, how are you, 
like spiritually, psychologically absorbing it or dealing with seeing girls for $5? Yeah. Well, the first time I saw that stuff, it, it made me cry. Yeah. Like, and I don't, at least at that point, I didn't cry. Now I cry more because things are, have made me more tender, I guess. But mm. I remember before I went one time that I heard a talk a guy gave where he said, when you see a lot of poverty and injustice, especially for just a visitor or a newcomer, there's not a lot you can do. You need to think of long-term solutions or partner with people, but there's not a lot you can do, but really it's going to make you cry. It should break your heart. Mm -hmm. And he said, so be aware of the things that make you cry because God's trying to tell you something. And I thought, this is a good idea, theoretically, but I probably won't cry. But the first time I went into those places, I went home and I wept like I never had before. And I, as I thought, yeah, to answer your question, what it did to me spiritually, after, over time, then I started thinking, oh my gosh, I mean, this men, you need men and women, you need people of all faiths, everyone working together, but you need good men to fight this battle. So I went to oh, law really? school to go do something about it. Oh. Yeah. So it's like, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to battle this, but today, like that guy said, today you, you really can't do much, but you're like, I'm long play. I'm going to yeah. go get training to like bring this down on like an epic level. Yeah, and I will do my part as a lawyer. Because, you know, like pe people will go and they get all excited. Oh, a group goes and raids this brothel, which I can say it. I mean, just that phrase, think of that. I mean, but it happens. But people get excited about the things. Oh, the people coming in. And, but you have to have a long-term plan because if you're going to remove these girls, what are you going to do with them? I've heard this, that they can be freed and then they'll just go right back yeah, to Yeah, exactly. So the first time I was working with a place in India, I did that. I was just actually walking through with some guys in these, with a couple of friends of mine. And I said, I'm going to show you these places you won't believe. And I was kind of teaching them about these issues. And these guys were telling us they had minor girls for sale. And it just made me so upset that I kind of, I, we basically took the guy and brought him to the police and said, you need to arrest this guy and you need to go rescue the girls. But long term, what happened is that I knew there was a group there that we could say, take these girls, but they'll go, they'll buy off the doctors because they do bone scans and things to identify how old they are, but they'll bribe the doctors to say they're 19. And very often, if you don't have a good plan, the girls will go back to so you people. have to think like steps one, two, three, four, five. You have to think really big. And yeah, and you have to have people that are, yeah, going to do some aftercare for those girls and have housing for them. You know, if there's adult women who were maybe trafficked as minors, but now they're 20, they don't want to be in the brothel, but they don't necessarily want to be in the safe home that's forcing them to be there. But the government home's not safe. But the home that they came from has rejected them because now they're in prostitution. So it's incredibly complex, that. Part of so it. you leave yeah. law school, and what do you go do? After law school, I worked for the DA here in LA County for a couple of years. So, because I needed a job, a district attorney. Yeah, so I was a deputy district attorney. That's like book them downtown, Dan. Like that yeah, sort of like yeah, we I think was, of. Yeah, the cops bring in their guys, and we. <laughs> that was a terrible. Yeah. I can't even move. I just said that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We. I was a prosecutor, so. But I um, knew that the reason I went to law school wasn't to be a prosecutor. And there's actually tens of thousands of people who want that job here. And I thought I was pretty good, but I thought the real reason I went to be a lawyer was to do this thing internationally. And everyone wants my job as a DA, but no one wants my job, what I'm doing now, right? So I thought I have to go do what I'm supposed to do. So you're in Los Angeles doing a good job in a job that people want. Like you're making it, but you're like, oh, this, mm -mm. Well, I got to so do something else. I went to my boss and said, I want to take some time off and go to Thailand, which was kind of my entry point to the stuff. And I want to go and work for a while. It'll make you look good. One of your DAs is helping to save the world, whatever. And they said, Troy, what's, your job is here. You can't take off. And I realized I had to choose. I either had to go do what I've been telling people I'm going to do, or I'm just going to talk about it. And so I handed in my resignation the next day and uh, um, went to Thailand. You're driving in that morning. You don't know how you're going to pay the bills. Do you after that? Not not after a couple months. Yeah. Okay, so you're driving in and you just know there's this thing you have to go do, yeah. but you have a paycheck and an, and you're you're climbing the ladder. You, are you nervous? Are you excited? Are you like, what am I doing? Yeah, that all all, all of, of it. The, all of it. I mean, I think. I mean, mostly I had you know deep conviction. Not like I'm the holiest guy, but just like 
you yeah. know, I'm going to do something awesome. And <laughs> one of my buddies, TJ... I'm not the holiest guy, yeah. but I'm going to do something awesome. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> not like awesome in a no, self important way, but it's no. like, I'm going to do something meaningful. But one of my friends, TJ, he he had heard me talk about it for like a year and a half working with a DA and he finally gave me 20 bucks and said, here's your first 20 bucks, like go do what you're supposed to do. So I remember I, when I resigned and then I set up a bank account because I had speak up my organization, I had it incorporated. So I took my papers, went to the bank and set up a bank account. I deposited my first 20 bucks. And then one day I sat at my desk that Monday morning and I said, I got 20 bucks in the bank and I should make a website, I guess. So I started. Let's go after human trafficking. Yeah. I got 20 bucks. Let's end human trafficking. Yeah. Or oh. my, my part of it, at least. Yeah. Oh. So how, from there to moving to Bangladesh, how long yeah. was that? Well, I worked for a couple years in Thailand. And I was teaching at a law school there and doing work with the police and some NGOs, other groups on trafficking cases and some immigration cases and there's a surprising number of refugees inside of Bangkok, urban refugees. And so I was working on that. But um, in, after about two, two years, I started realizing this is great, but everyone, you know, when everyone thinks of Thailand, they think awesome Thai food, great Thai culture, but the dark side is this human trafficking stuff for the sex industry. And I realized there was a lot of people and organizations that want to work there, even missionaries, nonprofits, whatever. Everyone loves to work in Thailand. And so I realized... I need to go like somewhere where there's new ground where no one's working. So when I was a kid, actually, I, I was living in these countries and my dad would quiz me on capitals and countries because I was into geography and social sciences. So I remember I knew Bangladesh was one of the most crowded countries in the world. It has frequent massive cyclones. Um, that, so there's massive natural disasters and it's very poor. So that combination, it's one of the most difficult, challenging places for, I mean, 160 million people in this small country. So I knew it was, that was a great place to go. And so someone from Bangladesh that was in Thailand introduced me to this girl's home that I went to visit. And that led me to go to Bangladesh. What is the, if we all came and followed you around for a couple of weeks, what would most surprise us, shock us, when people come see the kind of work you're doing, what most jumps out to them? Um, well, you know, like any new country, just the physical shock of a place. The density you know, of people. But there, yeah, there's really nowhere on earth other than like Hong Kong or, or like city states. There's nowhere on earth that's a, that populated, that that's densely, densely populated. Mm -hmm. So parts of India, the um, Indus Valley, and then down into Bangladesh. So... I think that's the the thing. So if you would go to some parts of maybe a similar economic level in anywhere in the world, it would remind you of that, but there's 10 times more people. So it's just that kind of chaos and intensity that comes from poverty or a lower income country, mm -hmm. but times 10 or times 20 in the cities. It's so, I mean, I've been in a lot of countries, but parts of India and Bangladesh are like nowhere I've been. I mean, Nowhere it's else. incredibly, I mean, incredibly lush and green because the whole country is this river valley. Um, so there's like more green and there's so its own beauty that you've never seen. But um, I think, yeah, the crush of people is something that you it's have to. the first to, thing. Now, yeah. a girl, a young girl gets sold in, it gets trafficked, gets sold into prostitution. Is there a, when that happens, is there a pattern is there a particular kind of family or a particular kind of economic circumstances? What makes a young girl yeah. vulnerable to this? Yeah. Well, um, just to be clear about our work is mostly on the preventative side mm -hmm. now. And most of our girls, the thing that they're going to deal with is child marriage. Oh. Um, so, yeah. So, our main issue that we're dealing with is child marriage. Um, although... Which is how old? Well... Technically, anything under 18. So, Bangladesh has one of the highest child marriage rates under 18 in the world. So, it's the highest other than countries in sub-Saharan Africa. But it's the highest rate in the world of under 15. So, there's nowhere on earth that has a higher percentage of girls being married under age of 15. And, so, and what happens then? Their dad says you're marrying that guy? Yeah. And it might be like, tomorrow you're marrying that guy. 
So these are girls, they generally drop out when they're 11 or 12, drop out from school, because the family knows that they're not going to, they have no future job. There's the economy, there's not jobs, positions for women, very poor families. They know they're going to marry them off, so why bother keeping them in school after fifth or sixth grade? So the family will generally think, up to fifth or sixth grade, the school just kind of takes care of them a little, but now she's developing a little, she hits puberty, it's time to keep her at home and we're gonna find a guy as soon as we can to marry her. So yeah, I know hundreds of girls, 13 or 14 year old that have gotten married. So the main thing we're doing is working at an education program in the village to keep them in school so that they won't, so that they'll have a dream for their future and the parents will believe, oh, it's actually worthwhile to keep them in school. Oh, and then they go to our dorm and then boom. They just, so what happens, yeah. so if that doesn't happen, they get married. How old is the dude they're married to? Um, uh, like your typical 14-year-old girl will marry a guy anywhere in his 20s. So it's not like marrying the 50-year-old guy. But generally it's a... So the, the marriage age, the legal age for guys is actually 21 in Bangladesh. For girls, it's 18. So they're forcing them, saying the guy, technically you're supposed to at least be on your feet a little bit. But if you're a poor village guy, you're going to... Whatever guy... So it's a 20-year-old, very poor guy. He's a rickshaw puller, a bricklayer, mm -hmm. something very simple. Yeah. The dad will say, Friday you're marrying this guy. Maybe you're marrying some guy, you don't even know who it is. You're going to get married on Friday. She gets ready. He comes. They get married. A couple days, the ceremonies, and she goes off to his village. And now she's going to be a poor stay-at-home mom. And you know, th I mean, this is the life for 80% of the village girls. 80% of girls in a village. This is how it goes. Yeah, in the village we work, it's... N I mean, we go, the villages we work, there, other than the girls in our program, there are no girls in school, other than, like, after eighth grade. So how does that then... She goes and marries rickshaw puller yeah. guy. How does... How, what happens then that she ends up in a brothel? Well, that's a very low percentage. But one of the reasons... So basically, the, a girl that takes that path and may end up being exploited in a brothel in the future might be she's married when she's 14. By the time she's 16, she has two kids. They're dirt poor, getting poor because they have kids. The guy's frustrated. He has no job prospects. And finally, he divorces her or he just disappears. So if he divorces her or leaves, the fa his family doesn't want her anymore. The family, her birth family, has given her away, yeah. and they've thought, we've done our job, she's not ours anymore. So if you're a 17-year-old girl and you have two kids with no education, you're going to go to the brothel, at least to make money to support your kids. So we work in several of the brothel areas. We know we've helped remove some of the girls. And um, the, one, the main one that we work, every girl or woman there either was born there because her mother was working, or she was trafficked there or kind of chose to go there, chose like w under, with no choices really, yeah. because that was the only way for her to make a living. So, I mean, it's incredibly noble in a horrific kind of way, but these, a 19-year-old girl says, I'm going to go to this Bani Shanta brothel because at least I can feed my kids. It's like it's survival. It's yeah. just basic, stay yeah. alive, yeah. keep food coming in. But the... But there are cases of the girls who are married where the guy, it's actually a fake marriage. A guy will go build trust with the family, marry a girl, take her to India, and then sell her to the brothel. And then come back to Bangladesh and do it again. And mm. there are... He'll do this over and over again. It's his job. And there, there are marriage brokers that are working with those guys. Yeah. Oh. I know I the guys that do that marriage part of it I don't know but we know some of the marriage brokers in the villages where we work that they go around and arrange it and the cultural part of it that's just arranging marriages it's there's something you know hundreds of years ago the idea was okay this dad's a daughter need to get married that guy's a son and someone would help make the connection but then you add these poverty and exploitation of women then it goes really dark really dark really fast yeah but and Oh, but, but most of the girls we're working with, I mean, that's one out of 10,000. They're going to go down that horrible route. Mm -hmm. Most of them are just going to be in these villages. 80, 90% are going to be married when they're young, 13, 14, 15. And there's a saying, they say girls are born for marriage. 
which might have this romantic sound to it until you think what really they're saying is, as a girl, your only purpose in life is to cook and to clean and have babies and give pleasure to your husband. And so your purpose in life is to be a tool. To be used. A, to be used and to be given to a husband. So the dads will say, my daughter's a burden. Like, and the girls will even internalize that and say, I'm a burden, so I need to drop out of school because it's too expensive. And what's the point anyway? And what you do is you bring imagination. Yeah, we help them to dream. Yeah. So when I first got there, I could tell you so many stories. Well, I think yeah. that's what we're doing right yeah. now. Yeah, 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 totally. But <laughs> that's when, why we're here. When I first got there, the I would go to the villages, and when I first started, I would ask them in Bangla, Bangla language. I'd say, what's your dream? How does that sound in Bangla, by the I'd way? I'd say, Tomar, ki shopno. Tomar means you, ki shopno, what is your dream? And such a short phrase, you can't mess that up. But the girls would look at me like, what? 12, 13-year-old girls. Like, and I would ask my partner, Utam, my main partner, and some people like, they, don't, they have to understand that. Tomar ki shopno. But he said, they understand the words, but the concept doesn't make sense. Because no one has ever asked them, oh, ki horte chao, what is your dream or what's, what are you going to be? So just think of that. Like these girls, no one has ever taught them, oh, you could be a doctor, you could be a teacher, you could be a pilot, whatever. They just know because their mother and any woman they've ever seen was married when she was 14 that years old. That question alone creates like a new world. Yeah. A dream? What are you talking about? What yeah. do you, it like opens up parts in the brain that... Yeah. So now they all know. They, everyone has a dream. So then after a few years, we realized every girl says, oh, I'm going to be a nurse. But now I said, when you get to seventh, eighth grade, you have to actually have a little bit of a plan too, not just uncle. Because they tell me, Troy, uncle, oh, uncle, I'm going to be a nurse. I say, so what will you do to be a nurse? And then we got the blank stare again. Then we realized, oh, we need to help these girls as they get into, you know, um, upper into high school, they need to actually know what a plan is so you can become a nurse. So we're teaching them at the lowest, at the starting level to have a dream, but you have to build that because you're fighting against hundreds of years of tradition and a culture that says you were born for marriage. That's all you're good for. And what's, where does the pushback come from? Like, what do people yeah. think about your presence in Bangladesh? Because um, you're, in some sense, a disruptive yeah. presence because you're bringing in a completely new narrative. Yeah, like, totally. So, Bangladesh is 90% Muslim and about 9% Hindu, and then a scattering of Christians and Buddhists and some stuff. So, in my experience, the Hindu families who were working, uh, probably two-thirds of the girls in our program now are Hindus who are descendants of the Hindu untouchable class, caste, the caste system. So every one of them, their last name is Dash, D-A-S, and that n signifies you're an untouchable, which is illegal, but you know those things take hundreds of years to work out. In my experience, the Hindu fathers are not too religious about girls' roles. They're more practical. They're like, if this really works, then I'm for it. But what you have to do to the dads is say, you, this is the benefits of your girl being edu your daughter being educated and becoming a nurse or a teacher, and I can outline twenty different reasons. Here's why it's better, but then you have to. They might say that's a good idea, but I don't have money. Then I need to say, well, not only is it an idea, we actually have the plan. Well, we can do this in the village. We d we have a dormitory, and we're helping girls all the way through. So you just have to be smart and choose this for your daughter. So the Hindu dads, for the most part are for it, although some of the Hindu priests don't like it. So there are some places where some of the fundamentalist Hindu guys have threatened us and don't want us to come back there and yeah, they're assaulting some of our teachers and stuff saying we don't like what you're doing. But girls love it, moms love it because they know what it's like being a 14 year old girl with no sex education sent to marry a guy that you don't know. Right? They know this, that kind of abuse. The Muslim dads, there's a spectrum, but in general, in my experience, they're a bit more, it's a bit more religious, their idea of the girl needs to be married young because that's how it should be mm -hmm. religiously. So the economic argument doesn't always win the day with them. But I have Muslim guys on my staff, 
and there are enough Muslim leaders and people that, and police officers and people that support what we're doing, that together we can make an argument. And the police are with you? Kind of. Oh, really? Yeah. So, in Bangladesh, it's, it's illegal, right, for girls to be under 18. But in most of the rural areas, in many of the ones, and I don't cover the whole country, just some small part, many of the police, when it really comes down to it, they don't care. So I will go to them with a picture of a girl on my phone, a 13-year-old girl. I say, this girl was married yesterday. Just girl like look like that. She was married yesterday in this village here, and she's gone. We're not sure where. So what are you going to do? And he'll say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, and I can articulate the four or five laws that I know were broken to have her be married, right? Then his first question is, is she Hindu or Muslim? And that is an irrelevant question. So I say, well, that girl, let's say she's Muslim. He says, oh, that's what they do. But if I said she's Hindu, he'll say, oh, that's what they do. So his attitude generally, many of them is, well, that's what they do. Now this is changing because at the highest level, the police support enforcing the law, but you know, three or four steps removed and down into the villages, the, you know, where some of the police don't make a lot of money. And if you go to this village where there's 500 people that don't want you to stop the marriage, they're not, they're like, I'll just let them do their thing. Most of them are not going to do something, but we're changing the tide by having more of the police join us and come meet some of the girls. And so I think it's changing, but it's going to take a long time. You know, for them to, for a lot oh, of them word. to really want to enforce yeah. the law. Right, right. Are yeah. you, uh, is this work, are you just a naturally optimistic person? Is this work got you sometimes like, oh my word, this is so hard? Or is it like, no, we have a team here, we're doing this, we're winning? Um, I mean, it depends what day it is. I mean, okay. I, so I don't think I like, I'm confident. I don't know. Maybe that's different than optimistic because I know the yeah. I know the obstacles, and I yeah. know we could be doing this fifty times bigger, and we're still just touching the surface, scratching the surface mm-hmm. in one country. Mm-hmm. So I'm realistic. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's yeah. an immense battle. Yeah, you know the the UN estimates thirty to thirty five thousand girls every day are forced into an illegal child Whoa. marriage. This is around the world. Whoa! Right. So let's say it's thirty thousand. And even if you just take out the maybe 20% of that that is like girls, oh, they're 17 and it wasn't, it's not so bad, whatever. There's at least 20,000 every day that it's a bad situation, right? This is like every four seconds. So one every four seconds. So I'm realistic. I know we're not going to end this anytime soon. But that part of it, you know, just the broader exploitation of girls. But like... Sometimes, you, may, you know how it is, you might wake up one day where you're in touch more with the beautiful side of things, and you feel that, right? I talk with some of the girls in my building, go to one of the, you know, village meetings and talk with the girls, and I go like, man, we're going to change, change this for girls one day. And the cool thing is our girls, many of them want to be lawyers, and we're training them when they go become teachers, they're going to come <laughs> back to their village and serve, right? We're not, oh, we're, wow. one of our core values is service. We're saying, we're not teaching you to be a teacher so you could leave your village. We want you to become a teacher so that you come back and serve people like, like in your village. That, so that brings me hope that it could have some, yes, sure. It could really change, but it's going to take a long time. So, but it, no, it's a tough, it's a very difficult battle and it's, yeah, overwhelming at times. But then there's other days, like you have the victory of one girl that does something incredible and you think, man, if I could get that a thousand times over, we're going to change this country. Um, ha- they call you Uncle... Troy Uncle Troy. is how they say it. Troy Uncle. Yeah. How many uh, girls call you Troy Uncle? Uh, about 1,500. No way. Yeah. What's that like? So, it's awesome. It's, it's, um, we have yeah, 1,100 girls officially in our program and a few hundred more that are our waiting list and hundreds more that just come and watch our meetings. So, you know, I lost track of some of the names after about three or 400. But yeah, well, you know, that's kind of normal. It, yeah, it's how, but no, it's, uh, it's, I, we have meetings where we'll have like 150 sixth graders. The next week, 180 seventh graders. We have our big training meetings, motivational meetings. So I go in there and th- I'm the only foreigner they really know. Other than Maggie and a few uh, visitors who have come, but I'm of the ones that live there. And 
you know, after about age like fourth grade, I can't hug a girl, so I just do the fist bump. I shake hands or do the fist bump, right, with like 200 girls in a row, and and it's it's beautiful. It feels like these girls are not just me, but my Bangladeshi team. They're they're they know that they're loved. They might not use that word, but they know they're cared for, and they know they have a dream that's different than anything that would have happened before, and they. They love you, so it's a beautiful thing when a lot of people honestly respect you and care for you. And so, no, it's to me. There's t I feel the great extremes because there's, in some ways, like I told you, I've been in many countries, and there's not been a harder place that I've lived than where I'm living in Bangladesh. But I have like a thousand girls that are call me uncle, and some of them know me well, and they share life with me, you know, in a way, and it's beautiful. It's like having a thousand kids. Man, oh man, oh man. Yeah. So how, so uh, how, like how do people get, people can get involved, people can support, like how do people get in on this? Yeah, well, yeah, we, the main way that people support us, well, people give money just directly to our fund just to help everything that we're doing. Yeah. One of the real tangible ways people support us is by sponsoring girls in our program. So oh, wow. on our website, speakupforthepoor.org, people come... Speakupforthepoor.org. Speakupforthepoor.org. So I, did I tell you my, how I got the name? No. So I was just about a year before, yeah, a year and a half before I started law school, I was doing this stuff in inner city LA and I was um, trying to think, what am I going to do with my life? And I always used to want to be a lawyer when I was younger. But then I was reading that um, verse that it's... Proverbs 31, it says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And I read that, and in Spanish, it says, abogado, advocate, right? I read that, and I said, that's my job description. Speak up as avocado. Ab abogado. 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 Advocate. Like, uh, advocate. Yeah, like an advocate, yeah. So I read that verse. It's Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, right? And I saw that, and I said, that's what I want my job description to be. And then I realized, oh, that's what a lawyer is, a good lawyer. <sighs> so then when I wanted to start so, an organization, so I thought I wasn't real creative. So I'm like, what am I going to call it? And I no, thought, oh, straight I, forward, straight I'm going to call down it the Speak Up for the Poor. Yeah, straight So down I refer the to it as Speak Up, but the, so our website is speakupforthepoor.org. And people can sponsor girls there. Go to the sponsorship page and there's hundreds of pictures of these girls that they can click on and it says... Um, what it might say what village they're from, but it says their dream, the girl that wants to be a nurse, and they can sort it by age and by, oh, I want to find a girl that wants to be a doctor, and they can and what's sponsor And uh, what's that cost? 30 bucks a month. $30, which is what? Education? Food? What's that? This is, their, this is for girls that are living in the village. So uh -huh. we're not paying their food and stuff. It's paying for their tutors. Yeah. So six days a week. Their parents are illiterate, so they need a tutor. Yeah. So it pays for their tutors, all their school books and supplies, Amazing. their big training, inspirational stuff. Then some of the girls, it pays for their dorm, living in the dorm. The older girls, it pays for them to go to university. So yeah. in looking at trafficking in the brothels, you're looking at like the whole system and realizing you can go raid brothels, but you need to go upstream. Yeah. And, and if a young woman has imagination for a better future and you can help her give the tools to go there, then this thing way down here happens way less. Yeah. And it's, you know, most of the, the flash or a lot of the money will go to the raids or the, that kind of stuff, which is awesome. And I am involved with some of those groups, especially in India, helping Bangladeshi girls coming back to Bangladesh. That stuff needs to happen, but 90% of the money needs to be on the preventative side. Because if every one of those girls, when yes. she was fourth grade, knew, oh, I'm going to be in this awesome program. Yeah. I can have a dream. And then I have girls that will tell, the, I'll tell you a story. These girls that will tell their parents, you cannot make me get married. I'm going to stay in school. And that girl instantly, then she's on a different trajectory for her life. You want to hear, I'll tell you the story. Yes, I do. The answer is yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so in this one village of Kashipur, where this girl here is from, this village of Kashipur, we've had several 13-year-old girls get married from this village. It's like just beautiful little tiny 13-year-old girls in this one village. It's mostly Hindu, and it's very kind of militant. It's not the right, but kind of fundamentalist Hindu village. 
And so, so many of the girls who were starting in our program were getting married at age 13 and 14. So we had a big show of force. We got the police and local authorities and politicians to come all to the village and have a big meeting one day. This is about three years ago. So a lot of times we have these big meetings, 150 girls and moms and our staff, and the men are kind of like, oh, that's a girl's thing. And I tell the guys, the men, it's not a girl's thing. If your daughter's a doctor, it's a you thing. It's good for you. But the men will say whatever, many of them. But the police came all with their shotguns, like 10 of them lined up. So all the men for the village came, right? Whoa, something's going down. The foreigners here, the police are here, the local dignitaries. So we had a big meeting and the police and me and everyone, we made a show of force saying no more child marriage. The police said very clearly, no girl here can be married. If you do, you'll get locked up. And so we're telling the whole village, right? So, but just like a week later, this girl, Oshtame, she's 13 or 14 at that point. Her dad comes to her, typical, just like they always do, and says, Oshtame, I've got the guy you're going to marry. He, he brought the man with him, which is unusual, said, you're going to marry this man. It's going to happen like in two days. And most of the girls, this, they'll, maybe they'll cry, maybe they'll get excited, whatever. They'll just be like, oh, I guess my time came. They'll go talk to their mom and say, get me ready. I'm getting married on Friday. But Ashtame, she's like our little superstar. She said to her dad, no, I'm going to be a teacher. I wasn't there, but they told me in retrospect, they told me the story. She said, no, I'm going to be a teacher. And her dad said, no, no, you don't understand. I've got the guy. He's right here. You're going to get married, and it's going to happen in a couple of days. And she said, no, you can't do this. She said, the police came and said, if you do this, you'll go to jail. And my uncle, referring to me, my uncle said that you can't do this, and he supports me. And my friends, her friends like her <laughs> teacher and the staff, they said they will support me, so you can't do this. I'm going to be a teacher. And they said that they were yelling and kind of fighting, and the whole village was coming around because it's going down. This 13-year-old girl. Defying her father. And she said no, defying her father. And now she's still in school. So if you go to our website, on our website, there's a little six or seven minute promo video, and inside of it, she's interviewed just for 30 seconds. And you can see that's the girl. So she's like 16 now, still in school. I think she's in 10th grade now. She wants to be a teacher. She's doing well. In the future, she'll live in our dorm. And five years from now, we'll have her in university. And But if you do that with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of girls, then you're going to avoid a lot of that pain. Because those girls, from going one out, I mean, if she was married, it's like, by definition, exploitation. I mean, it's on paper, it's statutory rape, right, for a 14-year-old girl. Mm. But besides that, just the <sighs> sexual exploitation that she's going to face, the domestic violence, you know, having a baby when she's not ready. I mean, all the, th the negative things that will come for that girl instantly are going to be avoided if she has the dream to stay in school and she has a mechanism that's going to help her do it. And if you do that a million times over, you know, I can tell people, we have a, let's say if we had 1,000 girls, you know, 90% of them in these Bangladesh, the rural Bangladesh, are going to have a really bad experience in some way. Even if it looks mundane, it's just a child mm -hmm. marriage at age 14. But I can flip that stat on its, and say instead, we're gonna, we can almost, not guarantee, but we can have 90% of them have a really good life experience if we keep them through school to like 20, 21. Right? I mean, some will drop out, some will get married, we can't control it all, but so that's when I realized that we need to do the work in the brothel. We need to do that prosecution, investigation, all that stuff, aftercare for those girls. I mean, like you need millions of dollars more to go to that, but 90% of the effort needs to go on that preventative side. Because if you change the way broadly the girls think about themselves and the community thinks about girls and the dads think, then you're going to eliminate most of this problem. That's what we're trying to do. Oh, man. That's yeah. really, really, really inspiring. It's so, really inspiring. Thanks. Um, are there any other stories? Yeah. Do, you, do you have any other stories? You're like, if I don't tell the story, because your stories are great. Yeah, I could tell, I could tell one. So like, Give me another one. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so um, su I have Sumaya and Suraya. I was, so, okay, Sumaya. This one I was telling you, Maggie. Sumaya in this village, she's about 13 years old. She's in a Hindu village. And what often happens is that in the, the Hindus are the minority. And I'm not saying this to rip on the Muslims, but in some places, the poor Muslim boys will torment and harass 
or perhaps even molest or rape the Hindu girls because they think they can get away with it because mm. the Hindu girls are oh, even lower. It, lower. So um, she is on the way to school. They call it Eve teasing. That's their euphemism, like Adam and Eve, Eve teasing. So she reports to our team, oh, I'm suffering Eve teasing. As they walked, the girls walked to school, the Muslim boys messed with her. And I'm not sure exactly what happened, but she was molested in some way. So we have a lawyer and our team kind of helped her get back on her feet, prosecuted the guy. He's in jail for a while. Um, and now she's back somewhat to normal. But one of the tensions is there is between the Hindu and the Muslim community. So only about two or three months ago, we had a meeting in the village, and we have a, we call the learning center, a school, little school room about the size of this office, like 15 by 40, 30 feet, something like that. Like 60, 80 girls will pile in there to do their homework because it's raining. And so what her, um, Sumaya's dad was, came at the meeting, and I could tell he wanted to say something. And at the end of the meeting, he said, Troy, this is in Bangla, he said, you need to build a second one of these schools in our village because we have so many girls. But the reason there's so many girls is because now the Hindu girls are doing well, but the neighboring Muslim area girls are noticing, so they want to join. So I thought either he's really cool because he wants to help the Muslim girls, or he wants the Hindu and Muslim girls to be separate in two different buildings, right? But I realized the beautiful thing was he knew that his daughter had been abused that we'd helped her and we'd never, we'd, we always say the Hindu, Muslim, Christian girls, any of them are welcome, but we didn't talk bad about the Muslim, but in this case it was a Muslim boy that hurt her. And um, he said, no, I, did, I want all the girls to get help. And I said, you know, if we have these two things, we're not gonna put the Muslim girls here and the Hindu girls here, we're gonna, they're gonna mix by age or whatever, right? And he said, that's cool, you can help all the girls. But how cool is that, even the dad, Mm -hmm. whose daughter was a victim of some of that communal tension, said, I understand you should help the Muslim girls too. Oh. Yeah. And I'll tell you one more story. Man. You want to hear one more? Yeah, of course. Okay. Seriously. What so else um, this little girl, Soraya. Soraya was in eighth grade and probably just an average student. But at the end of eighth grade, it, 10th grade and 12th grade, each of those three, they have a big test to go on to the next level to pass junior high to pass 10th grade, whatever. So end of eighth grade, she fails her test. And we went to her and said, what's the problem? You, we thought you're doing well, you're going to the tutoring, everything and stuff. It turns out that her father, who's really insane, like he legitimately is, he had run away and taken her uniform, her school uniform. And it's possible he even put on her school uniform because he's kind of insane and ran away for a few weeks. So she was embarrassed about her father and she had no uniform to go to school. So she said, yeah, for the last couple of months, I wasn't going to school because I had no uniform. And she was too embarrassed about her family to tell anyone, I have no uniform, my dad is crazy. So she wasn't going to school. So when she went to the exam, she failed because just the shame of it. So we said, okay, we'll have you come live in our dorm for about six months to get back up to speed so you can take those tests again. So her dad is still out of the picture. She's in our dorm for six months, doing well, going back home, and she's starting to take the exams, which later she did pass. But the crazy thing, she's back home. Now the dad's gone. The mother's like, I'm alone with my daughter. I have no options, no money. I need to get her married off. That's what they'll do, right? Just there's no, nothing you can do with her. But, um, but Soraya has, really been strengthened by us working with her and she knows, no, no one can force me. Like us doing, no one can force me to get married. So, but what can she do? This little 13, 14 year old girl, she has no power to do anything. So she told her mom, if you keep forcing me to get married, I'm not gonna talk to you. So she, we saw her a couple of weeks later after we sent her back home and she told us this. We said, what did you do? She said, I told my mom, I won't talk to you until you back down. So this was her way of saying, I'm gonna defy my mom, who's trying to love me in her own way, that all she understands. This is the mom only understands, I need to care for my daughter to get her married off for her protection. But she said, no, I want, you need to respect me. And then finally her mom said, I understand. You wanna stay in school, I'll let you do it. And she's beaming and she's happy and she's in school now. You're yeah. like, 
you're like beyonce these girls. That's a verb. Yeah. With this subversive empowerment. Yeah. But it's like redemptive and beautiful. It's not like a defiant, angry, no one tells me what to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. a sort of, Im- it's this other sort of, no, resist. Yeah. Resist the system. Yeah. And what you've been told. Yeah. But for good. Yeah. And the, it somehow seems like it wins the parents over in some way. Yeah. In some, not all cases, but in right. a lot of them, a lot of them will. But yeah, because you have like, uh, you have untold hundreds of millions of girls in that situation where right. they're, I mean, people are people and these girls aren't all angels, but they're just normal kids who very simple, but no one for the most part has ever told them, you are valuable. You can have a dream and I'm going to give my life to help you do what you need to do. The things that we want, that parents should do. So I, I get to stand in front of 150 girls and in my broken Bangla English say, girls, you like, we're going to, we're going to help you. You can reach your dream. You can do it. You're going to have to work hard. The point, our, our core values are hard work, service, and then the third one is self-confidence. We say you have to believe, but you can do it. And they eat it up because no, they've never heard anyone say that before. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. A lawyer in Bangladesh. Yeah. So yeah. good. Who would have thought? I wasn't like, when I was young, wanting to be a lawyer, I wouldn't imagine that's where I'd end up doing stuff, but... Yeah. Well, Robcast friends, there you go. Speakupforthepoor.org. That's, it's so inspiring. I'm just cheering you on. It's so great. Yeah. Thanks for your support. Really, really, yeah. really great. So, yeah, come visit us sometime and I'll introduce you to some of those. I'd love to see it. People and. Well, uh, this picture more. you just gave me of this girl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, this she's is. She's um, Shamoli. 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 Sure. Shamoli. Yeah, Shamoli. So she's 10 or 11 years old. Uh-huh. She's in fifth grade. So she's in that village of Kashipur, which I mentioned, where Whew. girls had been married, many her age. Yeah. And um, then Ashtame was like our little hero. Um, her older sister, Radha, is in our program. And um, yeah, she's just started in January in fifth grade in our program. And so a girl like her, she's seen for a few years our, um, she's seen her older sister and the older girls begin to stay in school and fight off child marriage. So for her, it's going to be somewhat normal. That this is what girls do. Yeah, what do was now. once a radical new idea is now like. <coughs> this is how we roll here. This is yeah. how we roll. Yeah, and so that's what the little fifth Man. graders are going to do. So it's we have fantastic. 150 fifth graders this year, and we'll have about that many starting in January again. That Because um, every year they're just. Yeah, they keep coming. They'll keep coming and coming. It's wonderful. And coming. Yeah. It's wonderful. Thank so, you. Thank you for the picture. Yeah. So it's great. You can keep that. And yeah, thanks for spreading the word. And we'd love anyone to come visit or visit our website and sponsor a girl. and. Of course, you're welcome to come and see something. I'll show you some places like you may not have seen yes, before. Yes, it'll probably blow my mind. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Grace Thanks and peace, everyone. Me.